Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, my sister's at it again. She, she asked me, okay, it's never gonna end, so how uh, do you, you know, how are we gonna deal with it? So I, I figured it out. I have my Mr. Rogers sweater on. I'm just relaxing in my house. I'm gonna take my shoes off. Won't you be my neighbor? I'm gonna sit it out by the fireplace. Cause it's never going away. I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, what's happening in the world? Thank God we're coming down. So it looks like our numbers are coming down. Europe continues to go up, which is a lot of the reason why in the European countries they're trying to figure out ways to mandate more vaccines. Texas looking, uh, the United States is looking a little bit better, a little bit. It's, you remember I showed you last week, it's all red. There's some lighter spots now. It looks like the Northeast is beginning to come down. But, you know, there's still a lot of parts of the Midwest that are going up in case number. In Texas, the urban centers have had their peak and they're beginning to come down. And in the Texas Medical Center, uh, our numbers are really looking better. We, we're coming down almost as fast as we went up. So last, you know, at our peak, we were at 13,500 cases a day. We dropped to 9,000, then 5,000. So we're still, you know, here. But remember, we're all high-fiving and saying, oh, look, everything's going to be great. 5,400 cases per day is still higher than the highest peak during the time of Delta. And until we're down in the 200 range, I don't feel like we're at a low-risk community. Our hospitalization numbers are also coming down this week. We're down to 338 per day, but that's 338 people getting admitted to our hospitals with COVID every single day, which is a lot. Omicron is the dominant variant. It's now 99.9%, .9%, all that's in purple. You can see orange, orange Delta very quickly replace Delta within really four to six weeks. And just one interesting thing, um, we've talked a little bit about wastewater surveillance and the microbiome as being a way to really follow the pandemic and future pandemics. And it really worked very well. Our wastewater surveillance program is a collaboration with the city of Houston, Rice University, and Baylor College of Medicine. We both, uh, Rice and, and Baylor, do a lot of the sequencing and the analysis and look for total viral load and then vari and the variants that are emerging. And other communities did this as well, California, Colorado, and New York. And if you go back and look when we became positive, it was right around Thanksgiving. So November 29th uh, is really when we first detected it in Houston, some communities northern on 28th, but it shows it was already present. And we detected in, in November 29th in the wastewater, December 1st, just a few days later, was the first clinical presentation where a patient came to the hospital, was swabbed and detected Omicron. Now in those urban communities, just like what's seen on the map for case numbers, it's beginning to come down, wastewater uh, volume in terms of viral load is coming down as well in Boston, New York and Houston. But if you look at Ohio, Florida and Utah, those communities are still rising. And that's the problem with the United States being so large. We're gonna have peaks that are now people are coming down in our urban centers, but there are other parts of the country, particularly the Midwest and upper Midwest, that are still surging. Now there's increasing evidence that Omicron is not as serious uh, in terms of virulence. So infection rate is how often the virus gets to another person, but virulence is how sick the virus makes you. And if you look at during the peak of Delta, which is very interesting, uh, the amount of hospitalizations, intensive care units, uh, admissions and deaths really kind of parallel each other. But Omicron's been very different. If you look at the peak of cases, it's vastly higher than ICU admissions or hospital admissions. But, the, but don't, we can't ignore the fact that they still went up. Hospital admissions went up, ICU admissions went up, and deaths went up. So it's not like it's a benign illness. It's a severe illness. It's just less severe than Delta. And there are a couple page, uh, papers published in the MMWR, that's the weekly report from the CDC, that were actually quite interesting on the presentation of Omicron compared to Delta and Alpha. So if you look at the onset of symptoms, with uh, the original version of the virus, it usually was you'd get, you'd get exposed to the virus and it took five days to develop symptoms. With Delta, it moved down to four days, and it looks like with Omicron, most people become symptomatic within three days. Very, very clear. It's, it's getting uh, more and more sort of like a, a other respiratory illness, like a common cold. If you look at what that means to peak viremia, so 
Uh, once you're infected, you, you start, you know, the virus starts re replicating in you, you get to peak viral load, and somewhere around there you're also developing symptoms. So uh, if you look at alpha and delta, we have good data for that. Peak viral load really was at day three, and by day six in most patients, you had cleared the virus. Uh, symptoms develop right around the peak of, your, of the virus in you, and that's when you're most infectious, right before you develop symptoms and for the few days afterwards. If you look at tests, well, the PCR is very good at detecting the virus in you even before it, you reach peak viral load and before you develop symptoms. But PCR remains positive even uh, a, as you clear the virus, and in some people can remain positive for several weeks, even a month. The antigen tests require that you have enough viral load that you can pick up the proteins, and that's, they're less sensitive, and you can see the antigen tests become positive, usually about, you know, a day before peak uh, viral load, around the time of symptoms. So when you start thinking about, you know, if you're asymptomatic but you want to be tested, but you use a PCR. If, you, if you're symptomatic and you want to see the antigen tests become much more relevant, uh, but again, they're not that sensitive, so be, having a negative antigen capture test doesn't entirely rule out that you uh, have the disease. There was an interesting study that came out of uh, a group in France that was just looking at how, you know, virulent Omicron was compared to Delta. And they did a very interesting thing. They looked at what is the risk of a 70-year-old being admitted to ICU if they get infected with COVID. And they compared that to the risk of an unvaccinated 40-year-old. So. In an unvaccinated 40-year-old, the risk if they get infected is about 1% that they would be, and that's the dotted line, that they would be admitted to an ICU. If it's a Delta infection in a 70-year-old, it's eight times more, so 8% chance they'd be um, admitted to the intensive care unit. Omicron is much less virulent in that group, and so it's only 2%, twice as much for the risk of a 40-year-old. And you can see it's much less than Delta, it's almost fourfold less, but it's not as good as vaccination. So if you're vaccinated and get Omicron, that's the same as, as being like a 40-year-old, which is good for if you're 70. And if you're boosted and vaccinated, it's much less. So it shows you that the risk is mitigated by vaccination and by boosting. And it also shows you that Omicron is less uh, virulent than Delta. Now, right now, it's really interesting. Omicron is also mutating, as we would expect, as it replicates, it mutates. There are now, there's now a branch of viruses that are all in the Omicron band, branch, and there are three different ones. Uh, there are BA.1, BA.2, and BA.3. BA.1 BA is the Omicron that's circulating. The newest one is BA.2. It's less common, but emerging. And BA.3, the most recent one, is rare. Looks to be, for the first time, a potential recombination event between B8, 1, and 2. And so that would have been the both two viruses in a single cell recombining. We haven't seen that, and, you know, it's a little bit, <laughs> makes me a little nervous because we don't want to see that. But that's what BA.3 looks like. And in, De in Denmark, BA.2, the new version of Omicron, has already become the dominant subvariant. And it's more, it looks like it's more transmissible than the original Omicron. Uh, the same thing is happening in the United Kingdom. BA.2 is emerging. Uh, it's a small percentage of BA1, but it is increasing very rapidly. And in the United States, in Seattle, about 8% of the cases are now BA.2, so the ver second version of Omicron, and that figure is, is increasing. So, you know, we don't know. It doesn't look like it's more virulent. It just looks like it might be, <laughs> amazingly enough, slightly more infectious. Uh, but it, again, it, it keeps raising the point that we need to get vaccinated. If there's ever-increasing data why vaccinations are really important. Another publication this week from MMWR, CDC, showed what's the risk of, uh, of uh, dying in, per 100,000 uh, patients who are infected. If you're unvaccinated, you can see it's 7.8. There's a 13-fold reduction if you're vaccinated and a 78-fold reduction if you're vaccinated and boosted. And, and exactly the same kind of data can be seen in, in Europe. So this is a this is from Switzerland. I could have pulled France or Belgium or any other, uh, any other country in Europe. Same kind of numbers. If you're unvaccinated, it's 11 and a half per, per 100,000 deaths. 13-fold reduction, exactly the same as in the United States if you're vaccinated, and 165-fold reduction if you're vaccinated and boosted. This is really important to understand why the CDC has struggled. And I feel bad for the CDC because, you know, they've stated 
But clearly, if you're vaccinated, it's two doses. Up to date now is three doses. Well, why did, you know, I, my view is everybody should get three doses. But why are they saying there's a difference? And that's because if you're just vaccinated with two doses, huge benefit. So it's not like you're not getting benefit. A third dose is even better. But that's why they're making the distinction between vaccinated being two doses and uh, up to date being a booster. You know, it's unfortunately, I think it's confusing to the public. But that's the reason. The reason is vaccination with two doses has a huge benefit for serious disease and death. So, you know, it's unfortunate. Un the real unfortunate thing is in the United States still, only 64% of the population has been vaccinated two doses and only 40% of them have had a booster. And as long as we have a huge unvaccinated population, we are gonna to continue to see the susceptibility of these patients, of these people to get, um, to get coronavirus. A couple of studies out of Israel, I know I had a big shout out to Vesna Neifeld, my old friend from Mount Sinai, who constantly is feeding me new papers from Israel. But they did an interesting thing. They, this is really another reason why you should get vaccinated. They looked at post COVID symptoms. And what they looked at is if you got vaccinated and then got COVID, Basically, there was very little uh, symptomatology afterwards. In other words, you recovered. Uh, there was another study that said you, you know, less fatigue and other health problems. So again, the benefits of vaccination are not only that, you, you know, in most cases it prevents you from getting the disease, certainly prevents you from getting serious disease, but it also, if you do get sick, it, pre it seems to work very well at preventing post-COVID syndrome. Now, all of that is why the Europeans in particular are looking for more mandates. The things that we hate in the United States, Supreme Court says you can't do mandates. Well, that's unfortunate because mandates work. And there's a really good example in Canada, Germany, France, and Italy. They decided to have a vaccine mandate. In other words, you have to have a port passport before you entered bars, gyms, and restaurants. And they looked, what was the impact on vaccines? Well, you can see in all four countries, there was somewhere around a 12 to 20% increase in the number of people who got vaccinated. And there was a study done in France that just said, well, if the U.S. had simply done what we did, try to you know, mandate more people get vaccinated, what would have been the impact? Probably would have been able to prevent about 50% of the hospitalizations and 50% of the deaths that happened since the last uh, uh, emergence of Omicron, which is really unfortunate. As we said, anybody who is unvaccinated and dies from this disease, it's really an unnecessary death. So a lot of new news. New news, is that, is that true? New news or is it just news? So a lot of news. My sister's going to smack me. I got new news. <laughs> we have some old news. No, new, we have some new news. Uh, let's see. Oh, anyway, uh, Moderna vaccine is now fully approved for the FDA. It's, no, it's taken off of EUA, the emergency use authorization. Both Moderna and Pfizer are now doing Omicron-specific trials, so we're eagerly awaiting those. We should see if... The, the new vaccines are particularly uh, good for that. There are two papers that came out from Baylor uh, faculty, actually, on the myocarditis in adolescents and kids. One paper by uh, Beacon Boskert, who's a faculty member in cardiology here, looked at how many cases per million doses of second dose. So in other words, twice as many doses, but per second dose. There are only 12 and a half cases of uh, myocarditis seen in, in people 12 to 39, all resolved without treatment. There was a multi-center trial that was published by Dr. Sugar uh, Damien uh, looking at 26 pediatric medical centers, and they looked at uh, patients under the age of 21, and for anyone who had evidence of myocarditis, found only 139 uh, uh, young adults, ranging from 12 to 20. Most were mild and all resolved. So the myocarditis is real. It's extremely rare, and it resolves. So th that should not be a reason that you don't get your kids vaccinated. And then the, the most important thing I think that is really waiting to, to, that we need more of is the antivirals. So good news on the Pfizer uh, antiviral, Paxlovid. It, it reduces um, the risk of, of hospitalization and death by 90% when taken. It's a three pills twice a day for five days, a little bit like Tamiflu. And, and, and it, it's really interesting. They looked at the protease of Omicron. So that, that is the same enzyme that, that is in the wild type. And you can see but the Pfizer compound, as, as the concentration goes up, it inhibits the, the main enzyme, protease enzyme, equally as well in Omicron uh, as in the wild-type virus, or you know, Delta. 
even though there's just one mutation in that enzyme. But, so that's really good news. The other uh, two drugs that are available, uh, the Merck and uh, Ridgeback Biotherapeutics drug, is a polymerase that inhibits a different enzyme. Uh, and remdesivir, which has already been approved for serious disease by Gilead, that is also a, uh, a polymerase inhibitor. Those two drugs have been improved. It doesn't look that they're, they're nearly as effective as the protease inhibitor, but they have been approved. And remdesivir in particular has been approved for uh, use at home to try to prevent high-risk patients from being hospitalized. Okay, and now for my favorite time of the, of the week. So what's going on in Beijing? Well, about 6,000 people, half the folks have arrived to enter the bubble residence. Uh, and so far we have 176 cases. 46 have happened within the bubble that, you know, is going to prevent all those cases from happening. We have three Russians, uh, the top ski jumper, Marita Kramer from Austria, and of course the Australian curler is out of isolation. Now, I don't know if any of you know what curling is, but it is the one sport in the Winter Olympics that you can actually fall asleep watching it happen. It's unbelievable. But this guy <laughs> or this person is is in isolation. Now they have to they go in isolation. They have to uh, stay there for seven days, and you have to have two negative tests to get out and compete. Otherwise, you get sent home, where you can spread it to your own country. Now, this is really fascinating because of global warming. You probably know there is no snow in Beijing for the Winter Olympics. How does that work? Oh, they're going to make artificial snow. So uh, artificial snow is going to be used for all the events. And I spoke to Lily about this. And, you know, Lily, do you really want to compete considering it's, you know, artificial snow? And she was undaunted by this. You know why? Because she said to me, it's all about the competition. It's about the competition. So she doesn't care what it's on. Bring on fake snow. She's going to compete. And my shout-outs this week, Happy Lunar New Year 2022 falls on February 1st, or fell on February 1st. Uh, and will culminate in the Lantern Festival on the 15th. I'm wishing everyone a happy year of the tiger. We're on the back of the tiger. Hopefully that will get us through this pandemic. Uh, also, today is National Wear Red Day. L Lily, of course, is wearing her red bandana uh, to wear, uh, raise awareness about heart disease and stroke in women. And then finally, uh, Dr. Atmar, our own Dr. Atmar, was lead author of the New England Journal paper that did the mix and match for uh, COVID boosters. And that paper came out. And congratulations, Dr. Atmar. Lots of great stuff. Uh, I think things are looking good. My, my assessment is, if everything goes well, we might have a decent march. Anyway, have a great weekend. And I can't wait to see it.